Well, the week seven waiver wire, it's not going to suggest itself. Therefore, I'm here for y'all. That's what this video is today. We're going to go through all the trending players that are being added, that are being dropped, and let you know whether or not you should be adding them, spending fab on them, suggestions, and dudes that you can get off your team. But, bruh, we've got Bo Nix at half a passing yard. I know Bo Nix has not been impressive this year, but they play on Thursday night football, all right, against the Saints. And all Bo Nix has to do is pass for one single yard, and you're a winner on underdog fantasy. This free square will be up all the way until Thursday Night Football, all right? So if you get onto the Underdog Fantasy app with our code BDGE, you deposit 10 bucks, you'll get this free square. You'll get access to our waiver wire rankings on BDGE.co, and you will also get a big fat deposit match on Underdog, all right? Let's get into week seven. <laughs> so let's jump into the quarterback position. These are all unserious names. Caleb Williams, Justin Fields, Jared Goff are all highly owned. We got Matt Stafford as a 31% roster player. I think he's a good streamer this week. We'll have to see if Cooper Cup comes back. I'm I'm going to lean that he doesn't, to be quite honest with you. If everything hinges on the fact that he needs to return to practice like this week. That tells me he's far less than 100%. But regardless, uh, I think there are probably better options on the wire at quarterback. Just because they're not trending does not mean they're not good options. All right. So the first one that I would obviously suggest to you guys is Drake May. The Patriots quarterback rookie had a really good statistical game last week gets to play the horrid Jacksonville pass defense so he's someone that I think you could pick up and not only be like a, a fill-in for either bye weeks or just like a one-week streaming option but someone I think might have longevity in good matchups throughout the rest of the season because of his rushing upside on top of it Andy Dalton would be another one that I would absolutely stream this week they get to play Washington he had a relatively bad game against Atlanta but Washington's secondary is also abysmal, and Carolina's defense is even worse than that. So they're going to let up a lot of points. Dalton's going to have to throw the ball a lot. Uh, I really like Dalton in a bounce back spot this week. And then we got Daniel Jones, who's just been playing really well for the most part for the last five weeks outside of the Cincinnati game that we just saw. But he should get Malik Neighbors back this week. They play against Philly. Philly is not a strong secondary. Philly's not a strong defense overall. So I think Daniel Jones will have a strong game against Philly. So those would be my top three streaming quarterbacks of the week. Let's move over to the more enjoyable, fun positions. We've got a lot of injuries. We've got a lot to talk about here. And at the very top of the list, we got Sean Tucker. Because if you go look at week six fantasy points and rank players, Sean Tucker would be at the top of that list as well. Now, the... Buccaneers beat the shit out of the Saints by the end of the game. It was kind of close throughout, but they ended up winning by 24 points. Rashad White did not play in this game. With Sean Tucker, I'm a little bit hesitant. Like, I think he needs to be owned. I think he needs to be picked up because we just saw the upside of what they have there. But to me, Bucky Irving is the clear workhorse in games where Rashad White is not playing and the game script is not a three-touchdown type of game, right? A lot of Sean Tucker's damage came at the end of the game. He was involved in the passing game, was involved in the running game. So was Bucky Irving. Bucky had a great game as well, and they clearly trust him because he's been running with the ones throughout the entire season. So Tucker's a dude that, yeah, again, should should be owned. But I think when Rashad White comes back, this, this ends up being a position where Tucker earned touches probably in this backfield, but not more than like a handful each game, in my opinion. So I think by the end of that game, the Saints defense was depleted. Like they're not tackling anybody. It's just, uh, I, I'm not overly hyped on, on Sean Tucker. I'll say that. So I think somewhere between like three and 5%, but I wouldn't go over the top because if Rashad White returns this week, they like to use him in pass pro. They like to use him in pass down situations as well there's a world where sean tucker goes back to like uh an absolutely like tertiary role here so he would not be my top waiver wire pickup at running back when we continue moving down the list we could just talk about the buffalo running backs all together clearly ty johnson at two frank Gore above ray davis will be a move that ends up on the very 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 wrong side of history here as we saw ray, ray davis kind of explode last night against the jets defense it should be noted that I know everyone thinks about the Jets defense as this like elite, elite group, and their secondary for sure is elite. Um, but now it's it might be without DJ Reed and uh, Michael Carter. So they could just have Sauce Gardner, you know, running shit back there, and that's really it. Their run defense has been awful all year. I don't know how much of you have watched like Jets games, but they their holes that they let up are massive. They are 31st in terms of run defense grade per PFF this year as a defensive unit. So they are really, really bad against the run, which is why Ray Davis kind of tore them up. That being said, he had over 20 touches, 150 yards from scrimmage, really close to getting into the end zone, I think, multiple times. So could have had a much bigger day. Uh, James Cook sat out this one, obviously, with a turf toe injury, but he did return to a limited practice on Saturday, and then he said he was going to suit up Monday. Obviously, players just be lying all the fucking time. That does tell me that he's trending in the right direction for week eight. That being said, though, 
kind of feels Ray Davis is is in that like Tyrone Tracy or Tank Bigsby or like that tier where they just play well enough that they have to earn a role. Like you have no choice but to start using them a little bit more in your offense. James Cook has been obviously in, incredible for the last two years, so I don't expect him to lose anything more than like a 10% opportunity share to Ray Davis. And there isn't a ton of opportunity on the goal line to begin with as more of like a, a, bru- a bruiser or bigger back relative to James Cook. Ray Davis played fucking amazing last night. But again, I think the limited practice on Saturday does point towards James Cook being on the right side of 50-50 for their Week 7 game against Tennessee, which is a very, very tough defense altogether. So Ray Davis is a stash. I think you have to own him. I think he needs to be owned. He's someone that I would probably throw, you know, 12, 15 percent on, especially if you're a James Cook owner, because now we see the entire backfield is super consolidated to one player. All right. And we don't even really see usage from James Cook uh, the way we saw from Ray Davis. And that is pretty eye opening there. So I think Ray Davis probably earned a little bit of a role, maybe uh, hurt James Cook's value a little bit. But I don't think he's really startable as long as James Cook is back. And again, I think he's probably trending in the right direction. Probably could be said with Tyrone Tracy as well. Another dude that just balled the fuck out. Now we have two weeks in a row where I think he is I mean, he's really, really highly owned, obviously, so I don't know if it's worth even like spending a ton of time on him, um, but he would be my number one running back pickup this week. I would spend 25 to 30 percent because I think there's a real chance that when Singletary comes back, like it's Tyrone Tracy's job for the most part, and he just continues to rip week over week over week and steals more and more work there. Let's move our way back to the top of the list, though. Tyler Argier is just a high-end premium handcuff. Uh, I would not be starting him weekly going forward. Despite the big week, the Carolina matchup was always juicy as fuck for the entire Atlanta running back backfield. They're down like multiple linebackers, all of their defensive tackles. They're literally running out like an unprofessional football team at this point on the defensive side of things in Carolina. But one player above him, we've got Kamani Vidal. Kamani Vidal, Rookie, a lot of hype throughout the offseason. Everyone knows this. Now, he had the he had the big game because he caught a wheel route for a 38-yard touchdown. J.K. Dobbins, though, is a workhorse out there in L.A. So, Kamani Vidal, again, just falls into the same tier of, like, everyone that I'm kind of talking about right now. The Tyler Algier, the Ray Davis, the Tyrone Tracy, even though, again, Tyrone Tracy, I think, has a chance to actually take over the starting job. Kamani Vidal clearly is not going to do that to J.K. Dobbins. J.K. I think just had 28 touches. Kamani Vidal played on 24% of snaps. Now, he's clearly like a really good handcuff to have, especially if you're a J.K. owner, because if something happens to Dobbins, and Dobbins has historically got more leg issues than fucking Lieutenant Dan out here, uh, Vidal will work himself into a really, really, really sizable role in an offense where the backfield obviously produces a lot of fantasy points. So again, Vidal is not a guy I'm going over the top with like maybe 5% of my budget, unless I'm a Dobbins owner. Maybe I pump, pump those numbers up a little bit. Tanks Big B is not available in any sort of serious leagues. Damian Pierce, I'm not looking at. Alexander Madison's got to be owned everywhere. Pierre Strong, I guess, is an interesting case when we talk about the entire Cleveland backfield. Jerome Ford pulled his hamstring, so he's probably going to be week to week at best. We have Pierre Strong, who came in and actually outcarried Deonta Foreman and played 53% of the snaps, which was kind of out of nowhere. Pierre Strong's a really explosive player. Great combine numbers, was just an explosive player in college as well. If any of you guys like watched his film, I, re- I remember being pretty high on Pierre Strong. That being said, Nick Chubb may make his debut this week, which I think just makes everything messy back back there. I think he'll be on a snap count, which means it'll be a three-way committee between him and Deonta Foreman and Nick Chubb and Pierre Strong. So like, I'm not going in on any of these guys in this backfield at the moment. Now, Ty Chandler is someone that, again, in serious leagues, he's not available because everyone knew about Aaron Jones's injury. But if he is still floating on your waiver wire, really tough matchup against Detroit. But Ty Chandler is a dude who, when the starter is out, gets like 80, 85% of the opportunities in Minnesota. They really trust him. There's there's part of me that feels like this is kind of like a Cam Akers situation again. I think Ty Chandler's a better running back than Cam Akers, but I think this is on the range of outcomes for him against Detroit, right? Aaron Jones is dealing with a hip slash maybe hamstring injury right now. He is week to week, had the bye week. So he might return to a limited practice on Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. And this might be a moot point. But if he does not and he misses this game, and I've listened to a few podcasts from you know injury people. They say it's possible that he misses this game. It's also possible that he misses the next game for the Minnesota Vikings as well. So there is a multi-week appeal here to Ty Chandler. Again, though, like we don't know if Aaron Jones misses. They have the matchup against Detroit, which is really tough. Then a really good matchup against the Rams, Indianapolis, Jacksonville. So the schedule gets really, really nice after Detroit. So Ty Chandler needs to be owned because if 
Aaron Jones is out. I think you have realistically with the matchup, probably a, a low end RB two with with some upside, just given the touch volume. He's a really explosive player, so he can kind of bust out at any given moment. Um, he needs to be owned, and you could start him as a flex play, uh, but obviously keep a very close eye on practice reports. So before we switch to the wide receivers, there's a couple dudes that are not on this trending list that I obviously need to bring up and address. One is Isaac Garendo, who is the backup to Jordan Mason in San Francisco. You saw him bust off that really big run. He's a combine absolute warrior athlete, freak specimen when it comes to just pure athleticism. Jordan Mason's dealing with an AC sprain in his shoulder. Uh, apparently, it's not very serious. He has a decent chance of coming back and playing against the Chiefs this upcoming week. But if he misses, I think Isaac Garendo gets a pretty solid workload. I like him in preseason when I was watching his tape back at Louisville. I thought he was a pretty good instinctual runner with a ton of upside based on his athletic profile. So you can definitely do worse than starting him as like a, a low end RB2 or a flex play for this week. And then quickly, someone I brought up last week that I, I think needs to be owned if you're a Kyron Williams owner is Blake Corum. We saw him take over the RB2 role in LA last week before their buy. And Kyron Williams is the dude who's dealt with a lot of lower body injuries. He's getting a huge workload. So if something were to happen to him, Blake Corum would probably step up into this offense that is starting to get back a lot of their pieces on offense, whether it's off offensive line or their receivers. So I expect them to be a much better second half of the year team than first half of the year. We shall move over to the wide receivers. Wow. Bub Means got to the top of this list. I thought this was going to be a sneaky uh, player that I can tell you guys more about that wouldn't even be on this list. But Bub Means is might be like the de facto wide receiver one for New Orleans on Thursday night football because we have Chris Olave dealing with a concussion. He's not going to make it back for TNF. We have Patrick Sertan concussion. He's going to be out on the other side of the ball. We have um, actually multiple Broncos cornerbacks are hurt right now, so they might be down like to their third or fourth string cornerbacks against this wide receiver group. We have Rashid Shaheed, who apparently suffered a knee injury either sometime during the game or I don't know when, but they said it's concerning, which that probably means if not day to day, week to week. Uh, and and likely missing this Thursday night game, which means is it Bub Means? Is it Mason Tipton? Is it Cedric Wilson? Like all, I think Cedric Wilson's hurt too. But Bub Means is 6'2", 212, ran a four four three forty yard dash, like really explosive, great athletic profile. Ran thirty five percent of the snaps from the slot last week, sixty five percent perimeter. Apparently, like throughout camp. Means and Spencer Rattler on the second team offense had like a really, really good chemistry. And then you saw it last week. He caught five balls for, I think, like 48, 49 yards or something and a touchdown. So he had eight targets, which was a really big number. And I think he could be like the de facto wide receiver one here for the Saints this upcoming week. So if you are desperate, if you're really looking for a flex like deep down somewhere, I think he could be an actual rock solid uh, PPR flex for you guys. Romeo Dobbs obviously needs to be owned. Alan Lazard as well. Josh Downs, of course. I'm not in on Vele. Michael Wilson, I think, is, again, probably more of fool's gold. He did get into the end zone last week, and Marvin Harrison's probably going to miss this game with a concussion. But I am, I'm not really too intrigued because he's not a high-volume player. This offense has not been a high-volume passing offense. It's not been productive, really. So Wilson doesn't really in intrigue me uh, much as a, as a flex play this week. Cortland Sutton owned, Shakir owned, Addison. What is this trending list? Okay, Gabe Davis, absolutely not. So that was the trending list for wide receivers. But there are a lot of big names that were left off here. And a lot of these guys are probably owned in most of your leagues. But I will start off with Pop Douglas. I think he needs to be acknowledged immediately. We have Drake May stepping in and playing some hero ball and putting up statistics. And they get the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, this week. Pop Douglas went for over 90 yards and he touched down. This was the Pop Douglas that we were hoping to get coming into the year. We were very high on him uh, throughout the summer. And now that Drake May is under center and is actually providing some juice to this offense, Pop Douglas is atop the list for me for wide receiver ads and, and free agent ads this week. Uh, Juju was probably added last week, but he obviously needs to be added if he was not because he looks like he's going to provide a nice little floor and maybe like pace out to that 900 receiving yards uh, that he did a couple years ago, being the Chiefs' like de facto wide receiver one behind Kelsey, and now you have Kelsey, who's you know a little worse than he was when Juju was the you know wide receiver one there. So maybe he's pacing out to an even better number there. Uh, Xavier Leggett is probably owned in most leagues, but if not, he scored a touchdown in two of three weeks through the three previous weeks, and uh, they get Washington this week. So you can definitely do worse. And I think Andy Dalton's going to have to throw the ball 35, 40 times to keep up with Jane Daniels. On the flip side, obviously Deontay should eat, but this should be a nice little uh, little crumb package coming towards Xavier Leggett. And the last guy I will put on here is Jordan Whittington. Again, I'm, I'm like very, very not confident that Cooper Cup plays this week. And if that's the case, Whittington has played such a big role and they get such a good matchup against the Raiders. In week seven, and if Cooper Cup misses, obviously Pook is out. I think Whittington is a rock solid PPR start again 
uh, for this upcoming week. So if someone dropped him throughout the bye week and you want to pick him up, that is someone that I would go uh, go grab for 5% of your budget. I think he'll still have a role when Cup returns in the Puka role. So I think he is like a usable flex play for you know the next month of the season. And on Pop Douglas, I should say a fab suggestion for him, like, I don't know that there's a high enough number. You know, I would drop 20, 25% on him if you're in a full PPR league because I think he's just uh, a beautiful fit with Drake May who compared him to Josh Downs in the preseason. They played together at UNC. So that will give you an idea of, of the way they're looking at him. When we switch over to the tight end position, there's really nobody I'm excited about on this list. Obviously, Ingram, Komet, Andrews are all owned. Zach Ertz, it's like literally the same shit, different week. KDOT and same shit, different week. Uh, the one name I would highlight is Hunter Henry. If he was dropped in any of your guys' leagues because he's kind of in that same Zach Ertz mold, same shit, different week. Uh, you know, some some weeks good, some weeks bad. But the difference here is obviously now that he has Drake May, you know, the passing offense is going to be a lot more explosive and look a lot better week over week, have a higher floor, have a higher ceiling. Um, and that excites me for Hunter Henry, another guy that we were excited about this summer. And it's pretty clear that the two dudes that are going to benefit the most from Drake May in the offense is Hunter Henry and pop douglas so i like both of them a lot and i mean you can think about grant calcaterra the dude out in philly uh dallas goddard pulled his hamstring but at the end of the day this is going to just be more consolidated targets to aj brown and Devonte smith as as it should be so if we're looking at defenses to stream as i always say we've got a formula we like teams that are favored to win their games we like teams that are at home and the bigger the spread the better so we have new orleans at home they're playing against Denver. They are two point underdogs at home, a 37 point over under. Like, this game is going to be so low scoring, horrible to watch, but they do play against Bo Nix. I don't love them again. Like, they're not even favored and they're just not really a good team right now. So, I would probably pass on the Saints defense. I mean, you could definitely do worse, but I'm, I'm not in love with them. You have the Commanders here who are seven and a half point favorites. That feels a little bit high for my liking, to be honest with you, but they are at home. It's a big spread. They are heavy favorites, so I think you could do worse. Typically, I stay away from defenses that I know are just really bad. They also just lost Jonathan Allen, one of, if not their best defensive lineman for the remainder of the season, which is a huge hit in the middle of that team. So like Washington, they're a horrible team, but by the metrics, by the numbers, by the way that I typically play the process, they are a relatively good start. You have Minnesota. They are definitely not streamable or available to anyone. You have Detroit. They're only 12% rostered, which is a little bit surprising. I guess they've been a letdown on defense, but following the absolute ass kicking that they gave Dallas, it makes a little bit of sense. They are two and a half point underdogs on the road. I don't love that. Buffalo is probably too highly owned. Jacksonville versus New England. I honestly think you could probably go either way in this game. Jacksonville's five and a half point favorites. Uh, I believe they're getting their cornerback one, Teron Johnson, back, which will be a, a big upgrade for them. So in London, you know, Drake may have to travel overseas, international game, first time doing that. I don't hate the Jacksonville Jaguars. I think they're a pretty good stream. I would add a couple other teams to this list, like Cincinnati. They are on the road, but they're four and a half point favorites against the Browns. And obviously, Deshaun gets sacked about 17 times a game. Cincinnati, you know, they had that little like players only meeting for defense. And they're like, we got to step it the fuck up. And then they did. They only allowed seven points to the New York Giants last week, which was an offense I was playing pretty, pretty damn well for uh, the last month of the season. So since he minus four and a half is a pretty good start. Indianapolis, they're minus three and a half at home against Miami. Uh, so I like that. Obviously, two is not going to be playing. So you know, that's a that's an offense who's just struggling in 17 different ways right now. So Indy is not bad either. Let's move over to the drop list. And I'll just kind of run through dudes that I think you can get rid of at the skill positions. Trey Sermon. I don't think I would get rid of him uh, only because he's he just had 18 carries. Goodson looked better, obviously, but Miami's a a good matchup. Trisham is getting a lot of touches. Maybe Jonathan Taylor's back this week. If that's the case, then obviously he is droppable. Ty Johnson, yep, he is droppable. Justice Hill, yeah, he's he's droppable in my eyes. Roshan Johnson, uh, they do have their bye week, so I guess it's not like imperative that you hold on to him. But the next bunch of matchups, Washington, Arizona, New England, I would hold on to him because it's become a two-headed committee, and Roshan's getting a lot of goal line work, so I wouldn't drop him. Akers, definitely droppable. Gibson, Gibson, I would I would hold on to just to see if Ramondre misses more time. This is a much better matchup for him, uh, and he got a lot of work. So if you know he does 
get the starting role again. I think he has a better game. Zeke definitely don't drop or definitely drop. Sorry. Tank definitely don't. Braylon definitely do not. Uh, Emmanuel Wilson, you know, just depends on your like, do I want to hold a handcuff for Josh Jacobs kind of tolerance. Jerome Ford, uh, if he's week to week, I think he's probably droppable because that backfield's about to get messy. Carson Steele, definitely droppable. Devin Singletary, definitely not droppable until we see what happens between him and Tyrone Tracy. Tolbert, definitely not droppable. Xavier Hutchinson, uh, I know he didn't really do anything in the first week. You can drop him if you want to. Trey Tucker, I wouldn't drop in case Jacoby Myers misses more time. Darius Slayton is droppable if Malik Neighbors is back from concussion this week. Dontavian Wicks, if he's week to week, yeah, you could probably drop him. Juwan is droppable. Jerry Judy is droppable. Jalen Polk, I, I want to see one more game of Jalen Polk before I drop him. Keon Coleman's been really, really disappointing. So again, if you need the roster space, I think that's fine. These guys, all these dudes, these next like five dudes are all like okay flex plays. Uh, Ray Ray's whatever. Quentin Johnson, better matchups ahead. So I think I would hold on to him. Jacoby Myers, I would hold on to because if he returns and Devontae doesn't, he's still kind of the wide receiver one there. Tutu and Whittington, I definitely wouldn't drop if in case Cooper Cup does not return. Ridley, you know, you're not going to drop. I think this is going to be one of those like um, squeaky wheel. What the fuck do they call it? I don't know. One of those situations where I think Ridley comes out and gets like four targets off the rip. This upcoming game, Rashi, you could drop. Cleal, do not. Alec Pierce, I wouldn't drop either. Yo Shavas is droppable. Darnell Mooney being dropped is the most fucking insane thing I've ever seen. Strange droppable with Evan Ingram back. T uh, Tucker Craft absolutely do not drop. Tyler Conklin, again, just one of those Zach Ertz types. Uh, same shit, different week. You never know what you're going to get. Him and Kate Otten. I love how Kate Otten. Wasn't Kate Otten on the trending list too? He's trending, he's trending both up and down. Mike Kosicki is definitely droppable. Conklin, I... I I mean, you got to be desperate, I guess, to, to roll him out there. But I think he's still a part of this offense pretty uh, heavily. And you got to like what the Jets did on Monday Night Football against the Bills just in terms of what their offense actually looked like. They used motion on like 79% of their plays as opposed to like 29% the week prior. So there was a clear offensive shift here that I think will benefit everybody in the long run. But we are talking about 32 consecutive games for Konkenstein. Holy fuck. Uh, just got... Just, 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 just got word that Devontae Adams is being traded to the New York Jets right before we wrapped up, which is perfect timing. The breaking, the Jets are finalizing a trade for star wide receiver Devontae Adams per rap sheet. That is huge news, all right? So don't drop Jacoby Myers. Brock Bowers moves up to tight end one for the remainder of the season. Maybe Kelsey. But the bigger news here is, okay, now what happens with the New York Jets? Obviously, a massive get for them. It makes their offense a uh, a million times better because now you have two elite separators in Garrett Wilson and Devontae Adams. Does it hurt Garrett Wilson? Of course it does. And like, we're talking about games where he's coming off of back-to-back -back 22 targets and like 15 targets last night. Devontae Adams is going to earn you know his his 10 to 12 targets a game. This is going to be a tough offense to stop now between – those two. So this spreads things out. I do think like Garrett Wilson to me is still, I think both of them are going to be top 15 fantasy wide receivers going forward. I'd imagine those two get almost every single target in this offense with like Lazard and Mike Williams basically competing for, you know, three to five targets a game where those two will get anywhere from eight to 12 a game. Now the chemistry between Rodgers and Devontae Adams is top notch, fucking absolutely elite. Um, so I actually expect him to step into a really, really significant role right away. What happens between the two of them, Wilson and Rogers, is going to get tricky. I think you just want probably either of them, and I think either of them will be fine because, again, we just did see this New York Jets offense probably play the best offensive game outside of the Patriots game of the entire season, right? And that stat cannot be overstated where they used motion on 26% of their downs against Minnesota and were upwards of 79% last night. That is just a progressive way of thinking in today's NFL. And Rodgers looked good for the most part. He's missing some throws and, you know, it is what it is. But this is such a big get for them. And I, I think if I'm a Devonta Adams owner, like this is best case scenario, assuming that he's healthy. If he's not healthy, then we got problems and it might take him a minute to ramp up. But if he is healthy and he plays 90% of the snaps this upcoming week. I do think that takes a lot of pressure off of Garrett Wilson, who struggled a lot in the earlier weeks of the season because every fucking safety would play over the top of him, so he'd be double teamed on most of his plays. Now, they've done a good job of scheming him open in recent weeks to where that pressure didn't come on, but now that Devontae Adams is on the other side, like they're not going to be able to do that. So for them, it's just going to be a bunch of one-on-one -on -one matchups where you have to decide who you want to take away. Um, again, it opens up this offense really, really heavily. And I think both of them, assuming Devonta Adams is healthy, assuming he is 
thrust right into a starting role makes both of them top 15 fantasy wide receivers. And as someone who has Aaron Rodgers in super flex leagues, that, you know, that's relatively exciting for me because now I think he goes to a relatively high ceiling, high floor player. Now, I don't I still don't think they're going to ask him to throw the ball 40 times per game. I still think they want to run it through Brees Hall and Braylon Allen. Uh, Brees looked obviously the best he's looked all season last night in that game. Buffalo is also probably a bottom five run defense, just probably worth noting there. But yeah, I think you've got to like all of these guys. Alan Lazard obviously was a dude that we kind of talked about for about 0.5 seconds. But uh, unfortunately, he's he's actually the wide receiver 11 in fantasy right now, crazily. But, you know, he's kind of knocked off. Mike Williams is knocked off. Yeah, I, I think it's good news for all parties involved. Obviously going to be a slight downgrade for Garrett Wilson just in terms of target numbers, but I think maybe this means more deep shots to Garrett Wilson, maybe less coverage over the top, and he could have some like low-volume games, you know, six, seven targets, but big production games. Overall, like he's not going to get those 15 target games anymore probably, but overall this, this I said overall 46 times in a row, this offense should move a lot more smoothly in the passing game now. So that is week seven waiver wire plus an instant reaction live real-time reaction to Devontae Adams being traded to the New York Jets okay and uh, if you enjoyed the video please hit the button that looks like this subscribe to the channel if you're new we'll be doing running back rankings and wide receiver rankings tomorrow plus a trade targets video on Thursday and if you want all of our waiver wire rankings right now you can go get them at bdge.co or for the cheapest price on underdogfantasy.com the underdog fantasy app deposit ten dollars or more Code BDGE will get you that free square of Bo Nix half a passing yard plus access to the Big Dog membership for the entire rest of the season for free. All right, I'm out of here. I love you. Smoochies.